You might be surprised to learn something that I was surprised to learn, which is that here we are in the 21st century. String theory has been going on since the 1960s, and it received a few major shots in its arm, right? It started out as just an attempt to explain the strong nuclear force. It failed at that, and it should have died away then, but it didn't. It stuck around. Uh, Then we figured out uh, supersymmetry, which allowed string theory to explain all the particles, all the building blocks and the forces of nature in our universe. And then we discovered that string theory automatically includes gravity. It's automatically a quantum theory of gravity, something we've been trying to have for well on a hundred years now. And it received another major shot in the arm in the 90s when we had five different competing string theories that looked totally different, but it was realized they might just be parts, pieces, chunks of a much larger, much broader, much more deeper, more fundamental theory, something we call M-theory. And... The status of string theory hasn't really changed in the past 20 years. There's still M-theory. We don't really understand M-theory all that well. Uh, There's still the five individual string theories. And we don't know if this is truly a theory of everything. We don't even know if this is truly a physical theory. And the problem is that we don't have an actual string theory. We have approximations and guesses of what we think the string theory actually looks like, but honestly, we don't know how close we are in our approximations and guesses. We could be right up against it. We could be really far away until you have that actual real thing that you don't know how close you you really are. And not a lot of progress has been made. Well, comparatively, I don't want to say there's been no progress in string theory. You don't, you know, not going down that direction, but relatively little progress has been made in the past 20 years because most string theorists appear to have given up on trying to make string theory a real theory of everything. They're still string theorists. They're still working on it, but they, they aren't, going after that ultimate goal. Instead, most string theorists nowadays are more interested in this holographic principle known as the ADS-CFT correspondence, which allows you to link string theories in a special kind of space-time that doesn't look like our universe, but you know you can still write down your equations there, map it to a boundary of that universe, and there it becomes a quantum field theory problem, and you use the techniques and tools there to solve your problem, and then you can translate back. Or you can go the other direction. You can take the quantum field theory that you're trying to solve, map it into the string theory universe here, solve your problem there using some of the ticks, trip, ticks, tricks and techniques and tips of string theory, and then map it back and solve your, your problem, your normal everyday problem. The issue with the ads cfd correspondence is one if you're trying to use it to understand string theory this is a string theory in a universe that looks absolutely nothing like ours attempts have been made to get this correspondence to work in a universe that looks like ours but you know they haven't gone very far and on the other side if you're trying to solve your quantum problem using some of the toolkit in string theory well the kinds of quantum problems you can solve with this correspondence aren't the kind of quantum problems we typically encounter in everyday life. Still, because it's such an interesting and intriguing connection, we don't fully understand the nature of the connection, and the connection itself was pretty much a surprise. Most string theorists are working on that. They're trying to solve normal, everyday physics problems using the toolkit of string theory, which is fine. I'm not going to argue against that. I guess that's fine. You know, assuming this correspondent works, assuming that you can actually make interesting predictions, and assuming this is an actual useful thing, yeah, go for it. But what does that leave string theory itself? String theory is trying to predict our universe... 
from the ground up, from first principles, from as simple base assumptions as possible. And it doesn't do it. It doesn't do it because we don't have a string theory. We only have approximation techniques. And so we, the string theorists have introduced this concept called the landscape, where the landscape is the set of all possible universes allowed by string theory. And then we just happen to live on one. And we get this set of physics, like this electron charge and this gravitational constant, because if any of those numbers were different, we wouldn't be alive to talk about it. This is called the anthropic principle. I don't like it at all. Feel free to like it. I'm not going to I'm not going to judge you poorly for liking it. Anthropic principle as a philosophical idea is fine. It's worth discussing and arguing about, but as a physics result, it's a little bit harder to swallow. The reason the anthropic principle, especially when it comes to the landscape, is hard to swallow is because one we don't understand the conditions that give rise to life and especially intelligent life yes yes if you change the speed of light then life as we know it on the surface of a watery rocky planet orbiting a sun-like star is probably a lot lower but is intelligence period off the map don't know we very well could be we you could point to some part of the kalabi yell manifold and say oh wow there's no way life could appear there no way intelligent life there and then over there they're sitting there or floating around there they're and they're going looking at our piece of the landscape and saying yeah, well, there's no way life could appear there man we don't know we don't know. We don't know the probabilities of life arising with a, set, a certain set of fundamental parameters. And we don't know the distribution of parameters on the landscape. Like, how common is our value of the electric charge on the landscape? Of the, all the different possible ways of string theory realizing a universe, how common is our electric charge? Are we the only one? with this particular electric charge or is it a really generic thing and like 98 percent of the entire landscape has this exact same electric charge we have no idea so on both ends of the landscape idea you don't understand we don't understand the probabilities associated with each fundamental constant as it's spread across the landscape and we don't understand intelligence and what can give rise to intelligence. You don't know either end of the anthropic principle, so you can't use it. It's useless. You're not saying anything. And that, if this is the ultimate result of string theory, if say, man, we can't figure out a complete theory of everything, the math is just too hard, and so we're just going to say we live in the universe because we live in the universe, what have we been spending our time on? And if ADS-CFT is a useful correspondence that actually solves interesting problems in the real world, more power to you, but is that really string theory? Is that really what we signed up for? more questions than answers. I've got one more episode left in this series, this long series that I've done exploring the nature of string theory. And uh, let's put it on trial. Let's see if it really has been worth it for all these years. I'll see you next week.